Sean Plunkett here with you through to 10 o'clock today. Now, I don't have a, an interview lined up for this half hour, but I'm going to grab, grab bag and go through a whole lot of issues. Well, to be frank, I feel like the platform has made the running on and your mainstream legacy media a few days afterwards or weeks after are catching up. Um, but we've still got some issues we're well ahead of the pack on. Firstly, I want to send uh, make a shout-out to everyone, particularly school children, who might be considering going on the climate change strike today. I know there's going to be a march on Parliament and a whole lot of people will be, be getting together in the streets and wandering around saying something. Saying something's wrong with the world and we must, other people must stop doing this or that. I imagine we, Izzy Cook, fresh from another trip to Fiji, will be taking part. Um, I would make this observation. You can't strike if you don't have a job. So calling this a climate action strike is just fundamentally, grammatically, logically incorrect. And I'd say to the kids, at least this one seems to be taking, well, a place after school. Um, but don't anyone, don't give up your day job and don't stop going to school because of silly protest actions like this. What are you really protesting? You're protesting weather. The fact that the weather changes, and as we're going to find out after 7.30, um, you know, and, and we hear the narrative, we heard it in that news bulletin, the narrative is because of Gabriel, we can now say that climate change is real and it's man-made, and all this other rubbish, like going vegan and everything flows from that. Well, well, the problem might just be um, that we're not being told the truth and Neera isn't giving us the full truth about the weather that we've had and climate change. So uh, I would encourage everyone listening not to take part in this protest. It is futile, it is illogical and it makes you look silly, really silly. But more on that, more on that issue later. I also want to give a most unusual shout-out first up this morning. There is a documentary that you can link through to, actually, from the platform app and on the platform page, made by good old legacy state-funded Red Radio, Radio New Zealand. It is called Boiling Point. It was not made, and this is important to note, with the Public Interest Journalism Fund money. It wasn't made with a grant from New Zealand On Air, and it was not made with some creative New Zealand funding which is unusual for most of the tripe that comes out of, of Radio New Zealand. It was made just with their operating budget, whatever that is. And it is a chronological journalistic look at the day, a year yesterday, when the protest at Parliament ended and what Liz Gunn, I'm sure frothing at the mouth, would say the fascist brown shirt dictators of the New Zealand police moved to move on the trespassing protesters who were, of course, illegally occupying roads and disrupting Wellington. And, and let's not get into their motives, which I, I think in the most were pure and honest, and they had a right and they weren't being listened to. But the great thing about this Boiling Point documentary, um, voiced by Corin Dan, and made, it would seem, by all the journalists who were down there covering it, I was expecting to be outraged when I saw it. it. I thought it would be some sort of fire and fury thing, the now largely discredited and laughed at fire and fury documentary that Paula Penfold made. I thought it would be rubbish. But I watched it yesterday and I was so impressed with it. I was so impressed with it that I sent a note. I rang Corin Dan and I said, that is a bloody good doco you made. And I sent a message to Paul Thompson, the head of Radio New Zealand, said you must be very, very proud of your people. Because what it is, is old-fashioned reportage. It starts at the beginning and chronologically tracks and has maps on how the police moved and what happened. And RNZ actually had quite a lot of cameras there and they were not all behind the police lines. Um, most of the footage actually is from the perspective or is shot between the lines or from the protesters' perspective. 
It is not emotive. It uses a little bit of music just to smooth, if you like, the transitions. It does not use fiery language. It does not use graphic enhancement apart from the map showing the movement of protesters and police. And most of it is just footage with the raw sound and letting you make the judgment about what you are seeing. It is such a rarity from our legacy media to see a piece of impartial, unbiased reportage today that this um, struck me as a most remarkable documentary. I want to this morning absolutely recommend to everyone who follows the platform or is Platform Plus member to follow the link and watch this and think for yourselves because what quite rarely for state media this documentary does is it gives you the space to do that. So I want to uh, tip my hat, pass a bouquet to Corin Dan and the team of uh, Radio New Zealand journalists who made this piece of work. I think it is superb in the context of the crap we get from the mainstream media these days. And you might be surprised um, at me saying this, but I do believe that you give credit where credit is due. And the um, uh, this Boiling Point documentary deserves it. It literally goes through it chronologically. And my takeout from it, having watched it impartially, and I'm pretty good at watching stuff to see if it's bent or an audience has been manipulated, it wasn't. It's the facts, ma'am. few observations from the journalists on the ground and some people that were watching. And here is my impression. That the police exercised a hell of a lot of caution and restraint in dealing what they were dealing with after 22 or 23 days of occupation. Uh, and I'm just going to say it, and I know people who were there will have their gander up. Watch the doco. They faced... A lot of abuse, not from every protester, not from the people, and I accept that the protesters were genuine in what they were doing. But by the end, there were a few hard calls left, and they were pretty nasty folk. And it was a, a difficult, tense and dangerous situation, which is now over. Um, so there you go. Uh, probably the only time you'll ever hear me recommend uh, a Radio New Zealand doco to platform listeners, but there it goes. Someone says it was a year ago and I couldn't care less. And you know what, Simon, you're allowed to, you're allowed to have that attitude. Um, oh, eight, oh, sorry, no, I'm not going to give the number, actually. So there we go. I start with a bouquet, surprisingly, for Radio New Zealand. Uh, we're going to have a break and then I am going to read... Oh, if I've left it, if I haven't... Yeah, no, I've got it here. I'm going to read a piece from The Spectator in Britain by Richard Dawkins, Professor Richard Dawkins, who we had on the show the week before last. It is a remarkable piece and well worth listening to because don't forget The Spectator International magazine. This will be read by people all over the world. And, man, it's a very interesting perspective on the New Zealand we live in today. Uh, look, we got an email. Uh, ben got an email from Professor Richard Dawkins, one of the world's leading humanists and public intellectuals who we had on the show week before last. Uh, finished his speaking tour of New Zealand Sunday here in Wellington and then jumped on a plane Monday. But we got an email from this week uh, and he emailed us a piece he has written in the Spectator magazine about his visit to New Zealand. And Richard asked uh, Ben to pass it on to me. And I've seen a few comments, oh, this will never get covered in New Zealand media. Well, I'm going to cover it now. And in the absence of being able to get hold of Richard, I'm going to read it to you. It's not that long. But listen to this and imagine what the rest of the world is thinking of us. And if you think there's something wrong in New Zealand, I think Richard Dawkins absolutely agrees with you. So let me read this because I think it's a very good piece and it speaks to so much about the problems in our society. So this by Professor Richard Dawkins in this latest Spectator. I'm in New Zealand, climax to my Antipodean speaking tour where I walked headlong into a raging controversy. Jacinda Ardern's government implemented a ludicrous policy spawned by Chris Hipkins' Ministry of Education before he became Prime Minister. Science classes are to be taught that Māori ways of knowing, mataranga Māori, have equal standing with Western science. 
Not surprisingly, this adolescent virtue signalling horrified New Zealand's growing up scientists. Uh, seven of them wrote to the Listener magazine. Three who were fellows of the New Zealand Royal Society were, threat- were threatened with an inquisitorial investigation. Two of these, including the distinguished medical science Garth Cooper, himself of Māori descent, resigned. The third, unfortunately, died. I was delighted to meet Professor Cooper with lunch, uh, for lunch with others of the seven. His resignation letter cited the society's failure to support science against its denigration as a Western European invention. He was affronted too by a complaint, not endorsed by the New Zealand Royal Society, that to insist Māori children learn to read is an act of colonisation. Is there an implication here, condescending, if not downright racist, that Indigenous children need separate, special treatment? Perhaps the most disagreeable aspect of this sorry affair is the climate of fear. We who don't have a career to lose should speak out in defence of those who do. The Magnificent Seven are branded heretics by nastily zealous, a nastily zealous new religion, a witch hunt that recalls the false accusations against J.K. Rowling and Kathleen Stock. Uh, Professor Kendall Clements, who was removed from teaching evolution at the University of Auckland after the School of Biological Sciences Puta Io Committee, submitted the following recommendation. We do not feel that either Kendall or Garth should be put in front of students as teachers. This is not safe for students. Not safe? Who are these cringing little wimps whose safety requires protection against free speech? What on earth do they think a university is for? To grasp government intention requires a little work because every third word of the relevant documents is in Māori. Since only 2% of New Zealanders and only 5% of Māori speak that language, this again looks like self-righteous virtue signalling, bending to knee, a knee to that modish version of original sin, which is white guilt. Matauranga Māori includes valuable tips on edible fungi, star navigation and species conservation. Pity the mowers were all eaten. Unfortunately, it is deeply invested in vitalism. New Zealand children will be taught the true wonder of DNA while being simultaneously confused by the doctrine that all life throbs with the vital force conferred by the Earth Mother and the Sky Father. Origin myths are haunting and poetic, but they belong elsewhere in the curriculum. The very phrase Western science buys into the relativist notion that evolution and Big Bang cosmology are just the origin myth of white Western men, a narrative whose hegemony over Indigenous alternatives stems from nothing better than political power. This is pernicious nonsense. Science belongs to all humanity. It is humanity's proud best shot at discovering the truth about the real world. My speeches in Auckland and Wellington were warmly applauded, though one woman yelled a protest. She was politely invited to participate, but she chose to walk out instead. I truthfully said that when asked my favourite country, I invariably choose New Zealand, citing the legacy of Ernest Rutherford, the greatest experimental physicist since Faraday. I begged my audiences to reach out to their MPs in support of New Zealand science. The true reason science is more than an origin myth is that it stands on evidence, massively documented evidence, double blind trials, peer review, quantitative predictions precisely verified in labs around the world. Science reads the billion word DNA book of life itself. Science eradicates smallpox and polio. Science navigates to Pluto or a tiny comet. Science almost certainly saved your life. Science works. Postscript. On the flight out, Air New Zealand thinks it's a cute idea to invoke Māori gods in their safety briefing. Imagine if, a British Air, if British Airways announced that the planes are kept aloft by the Holy Ghost in equal partnership with Bernoulli's principles and Newton's first law. Science explains. It lightens our darkness. 
Science is the poetry of reality. It belongs to all humanity. Kia ora. I think that's a magnificent uh, column by Richard Dawkins. I thank him for sending it to us and asking us uh, to spread its word. I'll have that whole column up. We'll put that up, that read up. Um, and what he's basically saying there is New Zealand is in a very dangerous place where wokeness is trumping science and Māori, uh, I'm going to use the term and it's pejorative, Māori mumbo-jumbo is being hardwired into our bureaucracy and our way of life and it is mumbo-jumbo. You can believe it if you want, but it ain't science. And I guess this is one of the reasons Rob Campbell left when we think about it. And I note he got fired from the EPA yesterday, as we all expected, and I'm sure he expected too. Rob Campbell wanted to build Māori mumbo-jumbo into everything. That's what co-governance is all about, it seems to me. So, well, that's what one of the smartest people in the world thinks about where New Zealand's at. Do you agree with him or not? We are going to do a story after 7.30 today uh, that we kicked off with Ian Wishart and his excellent report, Climate of Fear, um, that shows that, yep, and, and a whole lot of people are going to be marching in the streets of New Zealand today, not based on science, not based on evidence, based on woke suppression of scientific evidence and a news media that is whipping up a frenzy over climate change that is not borne out by scientific observation not borne out by scientific observation. Couple of other things I wanna uh, touch on right now. Um, Tusiata Avia's um, poem, uh, Savage Colonist. Now, Ben, you can help me here. So we've been trying to get some contact, uh, some comment from the Auckland Festival who uh, been paid largely by you to put on her work. Now, the Auckland Festival got plenty of time to say it's nearly a sold-out show. We're so excited to have this piece of racist crap on our program. Um, let's just work through them. So Auckland Festival still too busy to talk to us, uh, Ben? Auckland Festival still will not talk to us. Yeah, I noted to their media um, people uh, that they had spoken to media or at least given releases to other media. Um, they are still not engaging. And they do continuously note the difference between the poem itself, which has obviously been the subject of complaints to the Human Rights Commission and the stage adaptation that they are performing, that's kind of the line that they're sticking okay, with. OK, OK, let's move on. You mentioned the Human Rights Commission who've told us that they've had more than 60 complaints now, I think, that they are looking at it. Anything more from them substantive? particularly whether or not they'll reach a determination before the stage play goes on well, next that, Thursday? that was my main question. I mean, I have been conversing with someone from the Human Rights Commission back and forth, um, and they've given me an updated number of over 60. That was really the last... Uh, 60 complaints, that is. That was really the last time um, I had engagement with them. I then emailed to their media team, as well as asking this person for an official statement as to whether some sort of consolidated response would be made, what the timeline would be for that, um, but I think that their consolidated response that they're talking about is really just a statement from the HRC, which was two sentences saying, we're reviewing these complaints um, and no further, really. Oh, and, I, and, okay. and I mentioned so as well that yeah. the actual performance is yeah. set to be done next, 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 next week. Um, so if any consolidated response was to be made, they would really not want to drag their heels on that. But because of that, I, I don't think that, that they will. I don't think that any action will be made. Okay, so your feeling, your journalistic instinct My is telling you they instinct, are yeah. playing for time and they're going to let this go. I yeah. think they'll drag their heels on this one. Um, the performance will be done and they're hoping that they'll never have to talk about it again. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, all right, now the other thing is um, uh, Creative New Zealand, Stephen Rainwright, the head of that, um, they've given $110,000 to this uh, racist piece of rubbish. Um, what are they saying? Well, because they have been. They did an interview on old um, ZB. Yeah, well, their initial response With to us... With that bully, Heather Deepsey and, Allen. And, St and Stephen Wainwright has, you, uh, some of our listeners will know, spoken to us before for quite a reasonable conversation um, when they wanted to cancel Shakespeare. Um, but this time they seem reluctant and their first reason to us was, well, we can't speak to you, um, we're not speaking to media about this because we don't... Well, bullshit. They we don't to want ZB. to have any... Um, we don't have any control over artistic expression or what the artist yeah. uses to say. But I did note to them that actually he did speak to Hel uh, Heather Dubussy Allen's drive show the other day um, and I brought that up to them and they said, uh, 
Stephen's unavailable. You're welcome to come back to us next week if you wish. Uh, Again, okay. check for touch. Performance is happening check for touch. next week. And nothing from the government, from the Minister for Arts and Culture. No, I uh, nothing from the government. I believe it's Willow Jean Prime, Minister Willow Jean Prime, who's responsible for arts and culture. Um, and again, they came back to us with the note that they have no, uh, they do not, they will not comment on where Creative New Zealand chooses to put their funding. Well, that's exactly what they should comment on because it's our, it's not their funding, by the way. It's our funding, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, still no engagement from them from the government. Wow. Wow, Ben. Uh, I'm sorry, that's been a tough week, mate. You didn't get a lot of runs on the board. I'm used to it. It's fine. All right. We keep pressing on things. All right, so there is your update on that hateful piece of filth by... That's my... I'm, I'm allowed to have my artistic... That's my freedom of speech. Tui Asa... Tui Ata. Tui Ata. Tui Ata. Tui Ata. God, I've got problems with that name. Anyway, there's the latest on that. Um, tickets are selling fast and... Uh, um, the Auckland Arts Festival are just going around basically giving yeah, everyone who's worried about that poem, the middle finger, continue saying, oh, it's almost sold out. It's the hottest ticket in town. If you want to go along, it's at the Q Theatre in Auckland next Thursday, I think around 7 o'clock. If you want to pop in and see if you can buy a ticket out on the street, I'm sure a few people are going to be there. Not that I would incite any sort of protest or riot. Um, and look, the other issue I want to catch up on, which again we raised, I think, early this week before it became a thing with other media, drag queens reading stories to kids. There was an Auckland uh, library where a drag queen story time was called off because of protesters. And, oh, the free... Look, I've got to say the free speech union, sometimes they just miss the boat. Apparently, getting dressed up like a chick and reading to kids, that's an expression of free speech. No, it isn't. It's weird. It's just weird. Oh, and now it becomes, oh, are you not tolerant of everything? Look, the whole thing is, the point of a kid's story time is it's for kids. It is not a vehicle by which woke, woke virtue signalling councillors and local body officials get to spread their idea of tolerance for people who practise what is literally defined as a sexual fetish in the context in which they do it. i got no problems with drag queens i got no problems with drag queen shows, but it's adult entertainment, and they simply have no business. And, and this is imported from overseas, where it's a big controversy in the States, drag queens reading to children. This is using the children to advance your woke agenda. It's got nothing to do with wanting to read stories to kids and get kids loving stories. You're abusing the kids by advancing your woke political agenda, which you are allowed to have, but don't foist it on children. And I'm sorry, I can't... The, the, everyone's going to try and intellectualise the drag queens and library thing and say it's about this and about that. It's about guys who regularly dress up in women's clothes as parodies of women, wanting somehow to be mainstream. Well, you're not, and you never will be. I have dressed up in women's clothes. I have to tell you, Nelson College Fest 15, we had a thing, we did a ballet, which is a pretty boarding school, old school thing to do and we all ponced around on the stage at Nelson College. Okay, so I'm a cross-dresser. I don't do it every Saturday night. I don't do it in kids' libraries. End of story. And, of course, will the libraries, will Auckland Council get in and engage on that? Of course they won't. Um, and it's not a free speech issue despite um, the Free Speech Union saying it is, it's just a normal versus weird issue, okay? That's all there is to it.